So some of the studies that are ongoing right now are uh, a number of them at Johns Hopkins. Uh, so one of them is the, they're recruiting for um, um, a study that they're about to begin in the effects of psilocybin on behavior, psychology, and brain function in long-term meditators. So these are, you know, healthy people uh, who just haven't experienced meditating. Uh, Matt Johnson at Hopkins is doing a study with smokers who are having difficulty quitting. And there's some evidence that psilocybin may help these people quit. So there's a psilocybin facilitated smoking cessation uh, program. And this is a, a, a pilot study. Uh, there's another study, the effects of hallucinogens and other drugs on mood and performance. And the psychopharmacology of psilocybin in cancer patients. At New York University, there's a psilocybin cancer anxiety study, which is just wrapping up. Um, there's another addictions-related study that's about to begin, and this is the effects and uh, potential of psilocybin in um, alcoholics, people who have alcohol dependence. And with Hopkins, there's a, a study with the effects of psilocybin facilitated experience on the psychology and, effective, and effectiveness of religious professionals. So again, these are healthy people uh, that can volunteer for these studies. Uh, Peter Hendricks at University of Alabama, Birmingham, um, is just about to start a study in people who are addicted to cocaine uh, who ab abuse cocaine and would like to uh, quit. So uh, there's some preliminary evidence that psilocybin may be effective there. And at Yale, uh, Emmanuel Schindler is about to start a study to look at the e efficacy of psilocybin in cluster headaches. Um, if you don't know what cluster headaches are, how many know what the, they are? I see quite a few do. Uh, for those that don't, these are severe um, headaches that occur in temporal clusters, clusters in time. So people that get these may have um, maybe you know, 10 headaches a day for maybe a week, and then they won't have any for maybe six months. And then there'll be another week where there's a cluster of headaches. So they, these are extremely painful headaches. Um, and there's really no effective treatment for them. Uh, some people breathe oxygen. That seems to sometimes help, but um, there's some evidence that um, psilocybin and related tryptamines, even a non-psychedelic uh, form of LSD called BOL-148, uh, seems to have efficacy in uh, treating cluster headaches. But I would say there's a lot of interest now. So there's kind of... Um, several areas here. There are the um, effects on mood and um, anxiety, depression associated with a disease. And so we're looking at cancer here, but one could uh, think of other diseases that may cause anxiety. A person that's diagnosed with heart failure or end-stage kidney disease and has to go on dialysis or uh, hepatitis C or there are a number of diseases which could produce uh, really uh, an anxious state and um, psychedelics may be effective in those. And then there's this addictions umbrella. So there's alcohol studies, cocaine studies, tobacco. Um, I, I'm unaware of any studies with opioids, but that would be another natural uh, thing to look at. Gambling, um, other kinds of addictions. Um, so the field is wide open and, you know, as these studies have been taking place, it kind of makes it easier to do more studies. And we really kind of owe it all to Roland's pioneering work in, in 2006. Um, and I'll show you some of his data, um, but that kind of broke open the dam for clinical trials. There's another little film clip I'd like to show you. This is um, a CNN piece um, and interviewing uh, the patient who's on the uh, left here um, who has had a psilocybin experience and has a, a terminal cancer. If somebody were to say, well, how did you feel on your worst day? Is this a pretty good representation? Yeah, I think so. Just dark and mm -hmm. wretched and... Yeah, gloomy. 
With incurable stage 4 cancer spreading through her body, artist Norma Loring decided she had little to lose. Early one morning in a Manhattan doctor's office, she put on headphones, lay down, and swallowed a powerful psychedelic drug with the same chemical properties as those magic mushrooms that came to define the Woodstock generation of the 60s. It was kind of a, a wonderful visual world of colors and figures and motion and more profound than that for me was a feeling of maybe being connected through time to other artists to a creative force and to a feeling of uh of peace. In combination with therapy, that feeling lasted nearly five months. Though for some people taking part in this FDA approved New York University study, the feeling has lasted even longer. Because it's in the same legal category as cocaine, heroin, and crystal meth, the drug is kept under lock and key. So this is it? This small vial contains 100 doses of psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, and is valued at $12,000. Dr. Stephen Ross, an addiction specialist at NYU, has been given a license by drug agents to test whether the drug can help end-stage cancer patients like Norma. I've been very surprised in terms of um, patients having reduction or resolution of death anxiety, decreased depression, uh, living their lives more meaningfully, interacting with family members. Dr. Michael Gus is a trial investigator. Sometimes people with cancer um, <clears throat> begin to die earlier than their body actually dies. They begin to withdraw, feel like life has no purpose, life has no meaning. The trial is only in its second phase, but Gus says findings show a single dose helps people with terminal cancer let go of lifelong behaviors and habits. It's our hope that helping them have a spiritual or mystical experience will awaken and relatively quickly awaken a new way of understanding themselves. Norma Loring, a naturally positive person, says she is now more at peace. A feeling of being connected to people, the universe, the past, the present, that I'm just sort of passing through here. Okay. We're no longer using that twelve thousand dollar psilocybin. <laughs> it's way less. <laughs> Third, there's a company on the East Coast uh, called Organics that was providing <clears throat> some of the material, and they, I saw a quote. They dropped their prices a little bit, but it was like thirty k uh, for five grams which is still kind of outlandish. Um, you may think, well, why don't we just give them mushrooms? Uh, but for these <clears throat> FDA trials, they require uniform, consistent ingredient. And mushrooms vary, and as I pointed out, there are other substances which are active in the mushrooms. So to get this approved, um, it has to be a single substance um, that's well characterized. So... This is a little talk a little bit about the studies we're doing at UW. It's a pharmacokinetic study. I know that um, earlier in the spring, and I think in March, uh, Karen Cooper and Dan Muller uh, came here and presented. So they're part of the team that I work with. Um, but there are a number of other people I wanted to acknowledge. Uh, Paul Hudson at the School of Pharmacy is um, a, a co-principal investigator. Randy Brown is an addictions. Uh, specialist in addiction doctor at UW, who's a co-PI. Uh, Karen is an RN, uh, myself. Uh, Michelle Gassman is kind of our project manager. Uh, Dan Muller is a psychiatrist. Um, Gary Tarpley is kind of a scientific mm, officer. And Malin uh, Utzinger is, a, is also an MD and a, a serves as support and um, I I with the patients. And we all kind of form a kind of a steering committee to kind of uh, get the project going ahead. Uh, we submitted uh, an IND. So on that previous slide where I showed you the different phases, <clears throat> you submit an IND. This is called an investigational new drug protocol. 
and so that was submitted to the FDA in August of 2013. Um, it was approved by them in September 2013, so it was about a six-week turnaround time. The University of Wisconsin Institutional Review Board, IRB, uh, they also have oversight. They approved our protocol <clears throat> in October of 2013. And the Drug Enforcement Administration approved in spring 2014. And uh, our first volunteer session was in August 2014, so uh, about 10 months ago. Um, and so we have 12 volunteers. They're divided into full four cohorts of um, of uh, three patients, um, I'm, I'm sorry, three cohorts of four patients. So a group of four, they go through the series of doses and then second group of four and then third group of four. And um, the study is designed to uh, determine the pharmacokinetics of an oral dose in these healthy people. And the goal of this is really to support the phase two studies, which, as I said, are ongoing, and also to support a, an application um, after the phase three studies. The subjects take uh, three doses. So this is a dose escalation study. It's really kind of the first of its kind. They take uh, 0.3 milligrams per kilo dose, and then they have an eight-hour uh, session. Uh, the actual experience lasts pretty much over in six hours, uh, but they are they sit for, for eight hours with uh, sitters or guides, um, and then they go into the clinical unit and spend the night there, and there's continued uh, blood and urine sampling. Um, basically, what we do is uh, these people have an indwelling catheter in their arm. Blood samples are taken periodically, at first, it's like 15 minutes, and then 30 minutes, and then every hour, uh, uh, and, and so on. And they also give urine periodically. And then we have the these samples analyzed for the amount of psilocin present um, in the blood or urine. After... Um, the first dose, there's a break period, about six to eight weeks, and then they receive a second dose of uh, 0.45 milligrams per kilo of psilocybin, and then finally, uh, six to eight weeks after that, uh, 0.6 milligram per kilo. Now, if you do the kind of math, uh, this works out to roughly uh, a 20, a 30, and a 40 milligram dose, depending on a person's body weight. Um, 20 milligrams by itself is fairly, um, what, what's the word I want to use? It, it's pretty solid. Uh, I, I don't, I think 30, I, I mean, I know that Hopkins did, they, and they ran up some people to 30 milligrams, and they actually had to back down because some people um, became a little bit anxious uh, with it. Uh, and, and the subjects, uh, our volunteers, um, can completely, well, it's up to them whether they want to take a second or third dose. So they're, they're not forced to take anything that's uncomfortable for them. Um, the uh, study is totally blinded. Uh, volunteers are given numbers. Uh, so, you know, I mean, some people know who their names are, but when we analyze the data, we don't. But uh, one of the people uh, approached me uh, uh, couple months ago and revealed that he was in the studies and had gone up to the 40 and um, uh, said it was one it was the most profound experience in his life and uh, was still trying to integrate it like a few months later I will say that all of our volunteers undergo a pre and post interview they establish a relationship with the sitters uh, these sitters have training and there's also uh, there's a psychological testing and uh, people are screened based on you know they have to be healthy so people with pre-existing psychological or physical uh, diseases are excluded so they do get support there and uh, the although the, ex the experiments are not designed to look for a therapeutic outcome or even designed to find out what kind of experience you had they volunteer this and it, it's all recorded and so we, we know that it, it can be pretty profound uh, so what are what are um, 
Oh, I want to yeah, I want to uh, mention one other thing. They also they also have like EC, ECGs uh, hooked up to them too. So we're getting continuous like uh, you know heart rate and uh, blood pressure uh, assessment and so on. So uh, what is pharmacokinetics? It's this process. When one takes a drug, there's some amount of drug at the site of absorption. If you take a drug orally, that would be the stomach and gut. And then the drug uh, is eventually goes into the blood. It moves um, from the gut into the blood. And that, that process is called ab absorption, actually. Um, if one gives a drug intravenously, there is no absorption stage. It, it's already in the blood, so we're, we don't do that. But uh, So there is an absorption phase. Then there's a phase called distribution. So when the blood, uh, drug is in the blood, it can then distribute into bodily, body tissues. Um, fatty tissues, muscle tissues, obviously the brain in the case of psilocybin. And then the drug can be metabolized uh, for metabolites or it can be excreted as parent drug. And so this process is really elimination of the drug. And it's this process, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, which really defines pharmacokinetics. And these processes all take a, a, a different amount of time and it's of interest to know what that time is and what the blood levels are at those times um, just to just to make dosing decisions. And so we get this kind of uh, data in a, a pharmacokinetic study. We look at the plasma drug concentration um, over time. And typically you, you get this kind of curve. Um, you start out somewhere near zero, the drug rises to some peak level, and then as it's metabolized and excreted, uh, the level falls. Now generally for most drugs, there's a lower level, there's a lower limit below which the drug is ineffective. There are no effects seen. And there can also be an upper limit uh, above which one sees toxicity. And so we want to keep we want to keep the blood concentration within that range. It's called a therapeutic window. Uh, and so that's what our study is uh, designed to uh, determine. Uh, the psilocybin, uh, as I said, uh, you know, organics wanted 30K for five grams. And um, there's a company, uh, Lipamed, out of Germany that wants, like, I think it, it was 100 milligrams was like 3,000 bucks. Um, that's a lot, and so you, you know, because if you're giving like, uh, you, know, you can get like maybe five twenty milligram doses out of that. So, um, my role in the study was to develop a synthesis for psilocybin uh, to um, avoid those high fees and to maybe even uh, come up with a little bit better synthesis, which I was able to do. And so, this uh, slide here, I don't know if that's too small, but it, it's a five-step synthesis. Uh, um, the chemists in the room will appreciate this, uh, uh, but uh, the even if you're not a chemist, it's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> because before this, so this is five steps, like all the other syntheses uh, in the literature are six steps. And I was able to uh, cut out one step, which is kind of good because it, it saves you time uh, and exposure to chemicals, I guess. But um, um, so this is a four acetyl indole, and it, it's condensed to this intermediate here. Um, I don't actually isolate this; it, it's in the same flask. Um, I take this and condense it with dimethylamine, and, and get this intermediate. Now this is very stable, and this can sit on the shelf like forever; and it doesn't degrade or anything. Um, then this material shown here is reduced um, using this um, method here to silicin. So I have to go through silicin to get the psilocybin. Now you may ask, well, why don't we just stay with the silicin? Well, it's unstable. And so you have to keep it in the freezer and it's sensitive to oxidation and it, it, it discolors and stuff over time. Uh, so what we do is we take the silicin and condense it with this uh, reagent here to form this, ultimately this intermediate. Now this is extremely stable too. So that can sit on the shelf at room temperature without degrading. It's called a Zwitter ion. 
because it has two charges, it has a plus charge and a negative charge. <clears throat> so it's from the German uh, Zwei Switter ion. And then the Zwitter ion is reduced with hydrogen to give uh, psilocybin. So um, it, uh, yay, yeah, right. Uh, it, wor it works really good. Um, as I say, sometimes I'm exposed to chemicals. So, um, you know, I, here I am hard at work, uh, goggles, uh, gas mask, et cetera. Um, uh, a setup that I use, just one of the, I, I kind of like the glassware. Uh, it looks like. Frankenstein or something, I don't know, science fiction, and I always have fun with the um, colors and stuff. Um, so this is uh, psilocybin being made, but I really wanted to show you the really, uh, the beauty. Um, these are some crystals of psilocybin I made. Um, I mean, they're just really needles. Um, the, this has been recrystallized from water four times. It's extremely pure. Um, I have another shot here and I, I oops I hope you can see the needles uh, here um, I can't really blow it up much more but um, we've it's been analyzed by an independent um, agency and we generally analyze uh, about six or seven different parameters uh, things like uh, mass spec uh, NMR melting point residual solvents heavy metals I do work with lithium and palladium and the FDA wants to make sure there's none of that there. Um, water content, um, that's about it. And at the end of the day, um, I get a vial of psilocybin. <laughs> uh, so what are our future goals are to complete the ongoing uh, phase one and phase two studies. Um, and then begin new phase one and phase two trials later uh, for efficacy for other conditions. Some of the other ones I mentioned, like perhaps other addictive disorders, um, other forms of uh, perhaps depression or anxiety associated with other medical conditions, um, um, and, and other things. So. We, then we would initiate a multi-center phase three trial for a specific condition. As I mentioned earlier, it's got to be well-defined. And then we present this data to the FDA, and then psilocybin becomes a prescription medicine. That's the ultimate goal. Well, we're, we're, not, we're not there yet, so, you know, maybe... Maybe I'll come back after we, after we get a prescription drug, and we can all have a party up here or something. But, uh, but um, I want to say, I, I do want to mention that once the FDA has approved a drug for a specific condition, it becomes prescribable for other conditions. So this is so-called off-label prescribing. So a doctor can prescribe uh, psilocybin for maybe a healthy person. Where I mean, I'd like to see it. people have access who aren't sick. You don't have to be sick to take this material. Maybe you will benefit from having a spiritual experience or maybe you would benefit in a problem solving situation. So that would become possible um, if they approve it um, as a prescription drug. So that's about all I have to say. So I would say thank you and um, I would love to entertain any questions you might have and um, that's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot.